Well, please have a seat. And good morning, everyone. Let me um, add my welcome to Anwins. It's great to see everyone this morning. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at Sunbridge Road Mission. Um, and welcome, too, to those who are connecting online. Um, my mum actually has COVID at the moment, so it's online. So happy Mother's Day, mum. And, you know, um, as we've, we've talked about this morning, obviously everyone's experience of, of um, mothers is different, isn't it? But there are some things that seem quite universal. And as I was thinking about this sermon, one thing that, that came to mind is, is this question. Are you listening? Are you listening? Now, I think that's a fairly universal question that mums will have asked. You know, whether it's, are you listening, little Johnny, or little Sarah, or little Matthew, as it was countless times, I'm sure. Because kids have, have a kind of um, a, a skill, don't they? Uh, at, at nodding along, you know, at, at hearing what, what um, parents are saying, um, maybe even giving some indication that they've registered that, you know, a nod or a sure, yeah, yeah, sure, mum. But then doing absolutely nothing about it. So actually, when, when we ask, are you listening? We don't mean, are you hearing, do we? we? We don't mean, have you understood the words? I think what we really mean by that question is, are you going to do something about it? Are you going to act on this? And we can sort of laugh along at that. We can recognize maybe um, ourselves or children we know in that. But actually, we can still do that as adults, can't we? And we can still do that with God. You know, we can have a very similar attitude with God where we hear his words. Maybe we nod along our agreement. and We say, oh, that was great. I, I really agree with that. But actually, his words don't translate into action in our lives. They don't have any effect. And Jesus is well aware of that. He knows that. And, and this morning, we've come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And this last section is really Jesus' sort of conclusion, his so what, his application. And his big focus in this, this last section is act on it. You know, do something about it. To use, to use the Nike slogan, just do it. You'll, um, we'll read the passage in a minute. If you've got a, a blue card near you, um, the, the verses are printed out on that. Feel free to scribble on that if that's helpful. Um, jot down some notes. There's some questions on the back we'll use in a minute. Uh, this is the last um, of, of our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be then turning next week, uh, looking at Jesus' death and resurrection as we head towards Easter. I feel like if anyone's got a completed set of these, you know, they should be able to bring them in and claim some kind of prize. I haven't set that up, but you can, you can come and show me if you want to. Um, but let me, let me pray. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come into this world and into our lives, that in you, God, you make yourself known. And Lord Jesus, as we look at you and as we look at your life, Lord, we are in awe of you. Lord, you always did what was right. You always met people in just the right way. Lord, you always had that wonderful combination of power and compassion. Lord, of truth and love. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that we've had the privilege over these last few weeks and months of hearing from you, of hearing your words spoken into our lives. And we pray this morning, Lord God, that you would speak to us again. And we pray that you give us not just ears that are, that are ready to, to hear, but Lord, hearts that are ready to receive and lives that are open, Lord, for you to direct us. Lord, we, we pray that the impact of your word in our lives wouldn't just be that we learn something new or that we nod along and say, oh, that was great this morning. Lord, we pray that our lives would be changed. We pray that we would follow you more closely. Lord, that we would look a bit more like you because of um, what we've heard and what we've seen. So we pray that you'd be at work this morning in that way, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read. Um, so this is Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. And you can see that theme, can't you, of obedience, of living this out throughout um, each of those sections, and our title for this morning Um, is true disciples follow Jesus in obedience. True disciples follow Jesus in obedience. And the the first thing we see in those first few verses, verses 13 and 14, is that we have to choose to follow Jesus. You know, there's a clear choice there, isn't there? And I think there's a a picture coming up. And this is a picture, um, if we could have the next slide, from, um, I don't know if you can see it, that easily there. This is from the 19th century. You can probably tell, can't you? We don't do pictures like this today. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we'll zoom in a little bit. You can see a kind of artist impression. If we have the next slide, the zoomed in one. So you've got there, you can see that there's this choice, isn't there, between the wide gate. You see that on the, um, on the left-hand side for you of that picture. The wide gate, easy to get through. The broad road, you know, many people. But that road is heading to destruction. And then on the other side, on the right-hand side of that picture, do you see that small little gate um, in the wall? At the small gate, the narrow road behind it, and just a few, but that leads to life. And the choice is clear here, isn't it? You've got to take one road or the other. And the broad road stands for the way of the world. And, And it's broad because it's easy. You know, anything goes. All kinds of different opinions and ways of thinking and ways of doing and ways of living get on just fine. And it's, it's easy walking in that sense. Um, it looks very attractive, doesn't it, uh, from the entrance. Um, it looks popular and easy. The, the narrow road, on the other hand, is life in the kingdom. A- and it's narrow because actually, and it's not anything goes with Jesus, is it? Jesus is pretty clear about what it means to live for him. He sets that out. That's what we've been looking at, isn't it? Over the last few months, we've been looking at what it means to follow Jesus. And actually, Jesus has thoughts on what it means to follow him. Jesus has opinions and ways. He sets out what it means to be his disciple. And, you'll, you know, Jesus talks here about the small gate at the beginning. And there's another place, so in John chapter 10, where Jesus speaks of himself as the gate. I think he says this, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. You know, Jesus is very clear, isn't he, that the way to life, the way onto the narrow road, is through him, through the Lord Jesus. And, and there's a sense with the narrow gate, you know, that, that one, you've, you've got to, you can't take baggage through with you. If you've ever been through a really narrow entrance, you know, if you've got a rucksack or something on, you've got to take it off, haven't you, to get through. And there's a sense of that in the Christian life. Actually, at the beginning, there's nothing we can bring, is there? You know, we receive from the Lord Jesus. And even with a small entrance like that, there's a sense of the beginning of stooping down, of humility, of receiving. That's the beginning, isn't it, of the Christian life. It's receiving from Jesus. Do you remember how the Sermon on the Mount begins? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, the beginning of this journey is recognizing our need before God and receiving from Jesus what we could never do for ourselves. And I remember... um, in my early life as a Christian, I remember finding it so helpful when someone explained what it means is to, know, to be a Christian, is to know Jesus as Saviour, but then also as Lord. You know, as Saviour is that sense, isn't it, of receiving from Him. He is the gate. You know, only He can lead us to life. But also knowing Him as Lord and submitting to His authority. You know, when we become a Christian, it's a bit like we hand over the keys to our life, and now Jesus is in charge. 
I was, um, last week I went for a, a mountain bike ride um, with uh, Matt Robway and we were, um, we were on this kind of wide track, you know, gra- really easy track, kind of, ma- um, you know, gravel track and, and just going gently downhill. Uh, and we knew, though, that we were looking out for a, a path that came off to the left because that was the direction we needed to go in. But we missed it. You know, that track was so easy. We just kind of kept going around the corner. And before we knew it, we were way on past where we needed to go. And we had to kind of backtrack to find it. And actually, the path we were looking for was this very small, thin, little, muddy, kind of bumpy path that cut out through the trees. And it was hard going. But the key thing was not how easy the path was. It was where the path was going. You know, if we'd gone on on that gravel track, we were going completely in the wrong direction. It was easy riding, but easy riding the wrong way. Whereas actually that narrow, difficult track through the trees is what we needed to get to where we were heading. And I just want to, I want to speak particularly for a moment to those of you, maybe teenagers or those of you in your early 20s, you know, in that season of life where you're deciding where you're heading. You know, you're trying to work out which direction you're taking in life. I think so often when we're in that place, the question we're asking is, what's most convenient? What's most comfortable? Where's everyone else going? You know, those are the questions that lead you to the broad path, aren't they? Whereas Jesus is saying the question we should ask as we look out on our life is, where is this leading? Where's the destination in the end? I remember, um, in terms of how this hit home for me, when I was at university, I lived in a house with... Um, six other guys, you can imagine it was very tidy and hygienic, um, and none of them were believers, none of them were followers of Jesus, and it really got me asking questions, they were nice guys, they were good friends, it made me ask, you know, why do I follow Jesus, is it just because I was brought up in a Christian home, you know, should I just live with them, life seemed a lot simpler for them in lots of ways, but actually the thing I found really helpful, there was a, a verse in John chapter 6 where, where Jesus asked Peter, he says, look, do you want to go too? And Peter says, where else have we to go when you alone have words of eternal life? I realized that my friends didn't have any answers to the big questions about where life was heading, what life was all about, what happened after death. They just didn't ask those questions. You know, Jesus says, where's this life heading? That's what matters. I remember feeling the same when I um, started work as a management consultant. You know, in those kind of jobs, they keep saying, look, it's going to get better next year when you get a promotion. And then after that, it gets really good after that. And then you'll make partner, and that's the dream. But I remember looking at the partners. And in lots of ways, they were very impressive people. They they had lots of money and status. But as I look at them, I I knew that wasn't the answer to life. They they weren't happy or fulfilled. You know, relationally, they didn't know the Lord, lots of them, or walking with him. See what Jesus is saying? He's saying, actually, what matters is where these roads are leading. And that broad road is leading ultimately to destruction. It's the narrow road, the road that Jesus leads us on, that leads to life. And here's the thing, just like Matt and I on our mountain bikes, you won't drift into following Jesus. You'll always drift into the way of the world. That's how it works, isn't it? So actually, if you don't make any decision about whether or not to follow Jesus, that is a decision. And it's a decision to go on the broad road. And Jesus' appeal to us is, Jesus says, come and follow me. Come and follow my ways. Walk on this path. You remember how he approached his disciples, you know, like Peter or, or Matthew. You know, they were doing their business, weren't they? Um, out with the fish and the fishing nets or in the tax collector's booth. And Jesus said, come, follow me. And it wasn't like another little hobby they added into their lives, was it? Or a kind of interest that they did at the weekends. You know, they, they dropped their nets, they, they left their work, and they followed him. They went with him, very literally. And, and we don't necessarily physically follow Jesus in that way, do we, today? But Jesus' invitation to us is just as radical. He's saying, actually, put down what you're doing, you know, and follow me. You know, the, the choice to follow Jesus is, is just as big an intervention in our lives. So that's the first thing we see here. We have to choose to follow Jesus. And... At this stage, it looks very clear, doesn't it? There's just these two paths, the narrow way, Jesus' way, and the world's way, the broad way. But then Jesus sort of keeps going and shows that on the ground, things can be a bit more muddy and complicated. Because Jesus explains, actually, there are people who look like they're following him, who sound like they're following him, but actually they don't belong to him at all. And he talks here about false prophets and false disciples. 
So the first warning is about false prophets. So let me read again, verses 15 to 20. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Some of you might have seen um, in um, the war that's going on in the Ukraine, the use of deep fakes, if you come across that word. So there's been videos created, uh, both of uh, Zelensky and of Putin, which look like them. You know, it looks like their face in front of a camera. But it's not them, actually. It's a fake. And, And the message that's coming out of their mouth is not their message. And Jesus is saying, look, it can be a little bit like that with those that call themselves prophets. You know, a prophet in that sense is someone who speaks on God's behalf, who speaks God's words, who who brings God's word to bear on a situation. And Jesus is saying there are fakes, that there are people, and they look like followers of Jesus. You know, they, they use the same words. They look like sheep. They talk about salvation and discipleship and grace. And they do lots of the same things. They, they sing praises. They, they pray. They teach the Bible. You know, in that sense, false teachers, false prophets, they don't self-identify. They'll teach in Jesus' name. But, Jesus is saying, they have ulterior motives. You know, wolves want something from the sheep, don't they? In a very destructive way. And actually, Jesus says there are people like that who claim to be speaking God's words, but really they want something from the sheep. You know, sometimes that's money, and that can be very obvious, can't it, and brazen. Sometimes it's empire and influence. But, but actually, the, the result is the same as having a wolf among the flock. You know, God's people are left damaged, at the very least wounded, but sometimes fatally wounded in the sense that they're led astray and away from the Lord. So how do we spot them? You know, that's the obvious question, isn't it? How do we spot them? And Jesus says the test is fruit. You know, it's just the time of year in the garden, isn't it, where things are sprouting out and coming up from the ground all over the place. And when they start off, you can't really tell what it is. Or I can't really tell what it is. Can you? You know, they're just, they're, they're all, um, we were in the garden center yesterday, actually, and, and <laughs> we were buying some herbs, and the guy at the checkout um, I asked him kind of what these herbs were, and he says, oh, I don't know, they all look green to me. So, <laughs> but, the, but there's a sense of that, isn't there? That, you know, when they're coming out the ground, they all look green and they've got leaves. And you, you can't really tell what's what. You can't really tell what's a weed, what's a thorn, you know, what's a, 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 a fruit bush. But what, what, you know, you can tell, can't you, when, when suddenly there's raspberries on that bush, whereas that one only still has thorns on. You know, at that stage, you can't, it's obvious, isn't it? It's clear as day. At what's what. And that's when you act, isn't it? And cut one down and keep another. And I think fruit here, in the context, the, the obvious kind of definition of that is the life that Jesus has just been talking about. You know, Jesus has just talked about, hasn't he, for, for two or three chapters, what it looks like to follow him, what the kingdom life looks like. And as we're looking for fruit, I think that's first and foremost what we're looking at. So think of the Beatitudes. Is that what life looks like you know the, the meekness and a, and a poverty of spirit a humility a hunger and a thirsting for righteousness or think about some of the other things that Jesus talked about you know when someone does something wrong do they apologize and seek reconciliation is there a faithfulness and a purity in relationships do they have a secret relationship with the father where are they investing Are they investing in heavenly treasures or actually here in material things? What are they worried about? What are they concerned about? Is it the things of this world or the things of the Lord? You know, that's fruit, isn't it? And Jesus says, actually, as you look at that, you'll be able to work out who's who. So Jesus says, look at them. Look at people who are coming and bringing you God's word. And nowadays that applies, you know, here, doesn't it, within the church family. But with the internet, we have all sorts of people, don't we, or radio, coming and speaking on God's behalf. Jesus says, look at them. Look at those under their influence. Do you see the fruit of the kingdom? And so often, what do false prophets do? So often false prophets soften Jesus' words. You know, you get this in in the Old Testament. 
You know, the, 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 the false prophets were known for saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You get the point? Everyone likes the message of peace, don't they? But actually, when, when, the, when that's not the case, it, it's unhelpful. And so often, this is what false prophets do. They broaden out the narrow way. There, there are things that Jesus teaches which are hard, aren't there? There are things which aren't comfortable. There are things which you don't necessarily like. And false teachers will come along and say, oh, Jesus, he didn't really mean that. Or you don't really have to do that today. And they broaden out the narrow way. But here's the problem. The problem comes if we find out the reason that the road has felt so comfortable and popular is actually because we were on the broad road with the rest of the world. Jesus' road is narrow. So there's a warning here for false prophets. There's a warning here, though, too, about false disciples. So this is verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, I think these are sobering verses, aren't they? Jesus is saying it's possible to profess faith. And more than that, it's possible to achieve great things in Jesus' name and yet never to have been known by Jesus. And I guess the first part of this we're familiar with, aren't we? We have the phrase, we talk about nominal Christianity. You know, Christianity in name only. You know, and I guess we're familiar with what that is. It's someone who says, I believe in Jesus. But actually that has no impact in their life. I guess we could all think of people like that. Maybe we've been like that. Maybe we are like that right now. We'll say the right answers. We'll tick the right thing on the census. But actually, there's no obvious impact in the way that we live. And, you know, the, the, most, the, kind of, um, the most basic Christian profession is Jesus is Lord. It's what we've got written above us here, isn't it? Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's lots of people who would be happy to say that. But if we don't do what he says, that's meaningless, isn't it? Lord means master, the one who's in charge. Do you see what, if, we, if we say Jesus Christ is Lord, but we refuse to listen to him, that profession is meaningless. But I think the shock really is the second part of this. You know, Jesus here talks about people who prophesy and cast out demons and do miracles, do great things for God, and yet aren't known by him. And the, the person that came to mind here is, do you know in, in Acts chapter 8, um, uh, when the apostles are in Samaria, there's a guy called Simon, the sorcerer. And, and Simon, before the, the gospel about you know, the good news of Jesus even comes to him, um, Simon is impressing people with all the miraculous deeds that he does. You know, the, the, there is spiritual power outside of Jesus, isn't there, in this world. So just because something is powerful and, and there's a spiritual power present doesn't mean it's of the Lord. But then what happens next is um, the, the apostles come and... Um, well, actually, Simon um, responds to the good news. He's baptized. So he looks, doesn't he, like one of the sheep. You know, he looks like an insider. And then um, the apostles come and the Holy Spirit comes in that place in Samaria. And Simon comes up to the apostles and he, he wants to buy the Holy Spirit from them. And you see what's going on in his heart and his mind. That's not about serving the Lord at all, is it? It's not about Jesus at all. He wants to do impressive things through Jesus, with Jesus' name, with the Spirit. And rightly, the apostles say, we're not having any of that. It's possible, isn't it, to achieve great things in Jesus' name for ulterior motives. So Jesus says, actually, where do we look for assurance? You know, actually, our, what we say isn't always the most reliable. Even the things we've done, you know, our kind of spiritual CV, if you like, Jesus says, actually, the thing to look closely at is obedience. The test is obedience. And, and hear this right, okay? Jesus is not saying here, obedience is the way into the kingdom, or obedience is what makes us right before God. It's not, is it? The only way that we're part of the kingdom is because we have received Jesus' righteousness on our behalf, because Jesus has died for us, that we might be adopted into the family. What Jesus is saying here is, what do people in the kingdom look like? How can you tell? 
And Jesus says, do they obey? Do they do the will of my father? That's the mark of those who are in the kingdom. And actually, this isn't, this isn't just a one-off. This, this test, if you like, of um, true disciples flows throughout the New Testament. So I think if we get the um, next slide up, there's a few different verses. So Jesus, in, if you've been reading the um, devotionals we're doing as a church at the moment, in John 15, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Now, the sense here isn't by obeying Jesus, we become his friends. It's how do we know someone's a friend of Jesus? Well, they do what he, they do what he commands. And you get it, we get it in James. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Or in 1 John, the whole book of 1 John has this as a theme, really. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Jesus is clear, isn't he? You know, it's clear throughout the New Testament. That actually, if, if we want to look um, for, for signs that someone's a true follower of the Lord Jesus, are we getting on with what he said? Are we listening to him in our lives? I recently read um, a, a book by Helen Rosevere called Count It All Joy. It's a remarkable book. Um, and some of you will have heard of um, Helen Rosevere or read other books that she's written. Um, now, what impressed me the most about her and about what she wrote, it wasn't, you know, she's a well-known missionary and a well-known Christian speaker, but it wasn't that. And she's done amazing things for the Lord. You know, she's, um, she's been in the Congo for many years and built hospitals and trained up doctors, but it wasn't that either. The thing that really struck me was her obedience. And the premise of the book is that she read that book, she read that verse in James, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. And she said, actually, I'm called to obey that. And if you know her story, she faced some real trials. And so the book is all about how she got herself to the place where actually she could count that as a joy because she wanted to obey the Lord Jesus. What struck me was her obedience. You know, her whole paradigm is, what's Jesus asking of me? It was her obedience. You know, her whole paradigm is, what's Jesus asking of me? That's what my life needs to look like. So the, I guess if we're going to ask ourselves a question, the question would be, am I submitting to the Father today? Am I listening to Jesus today? Um, Eugene Peterson has a, a definition of discipleship which I find quite helpful. He says this, he says, discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. Do you see what he's saying? You know, a long obedience in the same direction. That Actually, day by day, we're listening to Jesus and we're letting him direct us. Well, let's, um, the, the last thing I want us to look at today is um, this last section. It's probably the most well-known section in this story of the wise and the foolish builders. If you've grown up in Sunday school, you'll know the song, I'm sure. Uh, we sing it a lot at home. The wise and the, I won't make us sing it here. The wise and the foolish builders. So let me, let me read those verses. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And here's the, the, the point I want us to take from this. Jesus' words only benefit us if we put them into practice. Jesus' words only benefit us if we put them into practice. You know, maybe as we've been reading through the Sermon on the Mount together, as we've been looking at it in our growth groups, you've wrestled a bit. How, how, what are we meant to do with these instructions from Jesus? You know, it feels, sometimes it feels um, impossible, doesn't it, what Jesus is asking us to do? So what are we meant to do with it? How are we meant to apply it? And I think, um, I think in order to, we can go wrong with the Sermon on the Mount in different ways. But in order to, to hear it rightly, we've got to bear in mind the words from the beginning, the words in the middle, and the words at the end. So if we have the next slide up. Think of the words at the, right at the beginning of Jesus' sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a danger sometimes with the Sermon on the Mount, isn't there, that we do fall into the trap of thinking. It's by living this out that we're right before God. But right at the beginning, Jesus is clear 
that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who realize our need and we come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. That's the premise. And then as we're invited into his family through what he's done, then he, he, he shares with us, you know, he teaches us what it is to be a son, a daughter of the father. And then we need to remember what's in the middle. You know, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Another danger with the Sermon on the Mount is we try and do all this at our own strength. You know, we, we, we write a list of all the things we want to work on and we get to it. But we do it without the Father's help. And that's not going to go very well. You know, actually, we can only do this, can't we? With the Father's help, with the Spirit's help, as he leads us. But then we also need to hear these words from the end. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. I think one of the dangers, and I think if I'm honest, this would be one of the dangers for me in my Christian life with the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe we say, oh, oh Jesus never actually expects us to live that. It's just to show us that we can't do it. But Jesus is pretty clear here, isn't he? He's telling us these words so that we live it, so that we get on with it. And, you know, the wise man here is the, the, the man who builds his house on the rock. That builds, you know, we're wise when we build our life on Christ. But Jesus here says to build our life on Christ is to do what he says. Think of, um, you know, if you, if you uh, live in an earthquake zone, you know, California or other, other parts of the world, you know, you're familiar with the threats, you know, of tremors in the ground. And you're supposed to, aren't you, um, put in special foundations if you're building a building that are earthquake proof, that kind of isolate the house from the ground in some way. But those cost a lot more money. So there's a temptation, I imagine, just to say, oh, it won't come here. We'll just put in normal foundations. And actually, most of the time, you can't tell the difference, can you? If there were two houses side by side and one had the earthquake-proof foundations and one had normal foundations, they'd look the same. Life would go on as normal. You find the difference when the earth starts to shake because suddenly the foundations are revealed. And Jesus is saying that's how it works here. You know, it's easy in some ways, isn't it, to be in church life, to be in growth groups, to nod along, but never really to put that into practice in our lives. And Jesus says a lot of the time it might look fine and no one really notices. But then things will go, become difficult. Hard times will come. And then we start to find the difference. I think we've seen this with COVID. You know, COVID has been a shaking, hasn't it? In little ways and in big ways, it's been a bit harder to follow Jesus. We've not been able to meet together as easily. We've not been able to sing for, for lots of our time together. We've not been able to see other believers quite as freely. And I've noticed that actually those who before COVID were really seeking the Lord and listening to him, who, who knew the Lord, not just when we were together, but on their own, who had that secret life with the Father, who enjoyed reading the word and spending time with their Father in prayer. Actually, it's not that it's been easy for people like that, but spiritually they've grown and thrived under the challenges of COVID. But there have been others who maybe were a bit more, were really dependent on when we got together for their spiritual life, who have really struggled. You know, some who've fallen away during this time. So, that, so actually, it's as we put God's words into practice. As we, we build our life on Christ, not just intellectually, but practically, that, we bring, that, that there's a strong foundation. And ultimately, that, you know, COVID or, you know, is a picture, isn't it, of the great day of judgment. That's the great shaking that really matters. And Jesus says, make sure you've got a solid foundation. And his language is pretty strong, isn't it? You know, Jesus says, if you, if you hear my words and do nothing about it, and it's pretty possible to do that, isn't it? You remember what we were saying at the beginning with that child and the mum who says, you know, are you listening? It's very easy for us to do that, isn't it? You know, to, to sit and hear a sermon at church, to sit in a growth group, to read our Bible in the morning, and to hear what's being said, maybe to nod along, maybe to say to someone, oh, that was really helpful, or I really appreciate that point, but then actually not to do anything with it. Jesus says, if that's us, we're fools. It's strong language. But why is that? Well, the Sermon on the Mount ends with a reminder of who is speaking. So, the, you know, when we come to church, it's not just my words. This is Jesus speaking to us. You know, he is the one who has made all things. God's son. He's our Lord, our master, our savior. 
There was a, a lovely story um, in, the, in the papers this, um, in, or in the news this week. Some of you might have seen it. Um, there was a, a Radio 2 show, um, uh, a, a cooking show with um, Gordon Ramsay on it. And at some point, um, a lady called Tina Clark rang in. And she was um, a dinner lady at Edward Peak Middle School uh, in the kitchen there. And she rang in basically to say, look, I'm on my own here and I need some help. Um, and Gordon, what are you going to do about it? You know, she was, um, I think two of her staff were off sick with COVID and she was facing kind of a, a desperate day in the kitchen. And so she rang in for help. And, and Gordon Ramsay said, look, I can't come, but I'm going to send you one of my chefs. So a guy called Rob Roy Cameron, you know, got straight in a taxi and headed over to Edward Peak Middle School and spent the day uh, with Tina and I think one or two others. I think there's a picture of them, here they are, um, you know, making lunch for the kids there. It's a great story, isn't it? But imagine that after, you know, after calling up and saying, look, I really need some help. Imagine that Rob Roy Cameron arrives in the kitchen and then the team don't listen to a word he has to say. You know, he's a professional chef. You know, um, working with Gordon Ramsay. Imagine he arrives in that kitchen and he starts giving them some advice about how they could save a bit of time or, or actually do that a little bit better. And they say, oh, no, it's, thank it's, it's all right, thanks, Rob. It'd be foolish, wouldn't it? It'd be foolish. And, and how much more for us with the Lord Jesus? He's not just a chef, is he? He's not even just a teacher. He's the Lord of all. He's made us. He's made the whole world. And, and, and effectively, over the last you know, few months... He's been coming alongside us and say, this is my way. This is the way to live. Walk in it. And, you know, the, the, um, the ladies in the kitchen with Rob Roy Cameron that day, there's no, there's no way they'd have been able to do it as well as him. But that doesn't stop you trying, does it? Just because you won't be able to pull it off quite like he can pull it off. Actually, there's still a goodness in that. And isn't it the same with us? Well, we'll never walk this out as fully as the Lord Jesus. But should that stop us trying? His ways are still good. So what, is, you know, what does all this mean for us as a church? We've spent, you know, from January, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount together. What's our aim? You know, what do we long to see with this series? Well, it's more than knowledge. You know, I hope we have learned new things about, about Jesus, about the kingdom, about what it means to belong to him. But actually, you know, our aim is more than knowledge, isn't it? It's not just that we've learned a bit more, some facts about Matthew 5 to 7 that we can pull out at different times. But actually, surely our aim is even more than conviction. I'm sure at times the Lord has spoken to us in this series. You know, maybe it's when we were looking about that passage about reconciliation, about Jesus, the priority when we've wronged someone, of not sitting in our rage, but as immediately going and doing all we can to seek reconciliation. And maybe actually someone was on our mind. Or maybe it was that... Um, we were looking, weren't we, at, at what Jesus was saying about faithfulness and purity in our relationships. You know, and maybe there's, there's an unhealthy relationship that we're a part of that we were challenged by. Or maybe it's what we look at in Matthew 6 about that, the priority of that secret life with our Father, of doing things before him and him alone. Or maybe we were, you know, God spoke to us in that section on priorities and we realized actually we do worry too much about money and possessions rather than his kingdom. But the danger is it stays there, doesn't it? Maybe we wrote some stuff down off it's a paper. But actually, surely the aim is the next step. You know, Jesus is saying, let's live this out. Let's trust him. Let's live his way. You know, it's, it's, it's as if Jesus is saying to us, like, like mum used to say to us, are you listening? Are you listening? You know, these words just going in one ear and out the other. Are you listening? Are you willing this week to actually live this out? You know, that's my prayer for, for me, but for us as a church, that we delight in walking in Jesus' way. That's our encouragement to one another in growth groups. You know, we come with situations in our lives and we say to each other, how do I put this into practice? What does it look like for me to, to, to live for Jesus here? It's, I don't know what to do. And we help each other to follow Jesus together. Well, I'm going to, in a moment, we're going to just have a bit of time to, um, to reflect. You, you can use the questions on the back of that blue sheet. You know, particularly that question, what's this going to look like if I put this into practice? You can do that on your own if that's helpful. Um, but you might want to turn to someone next to you and just share, you know, what's been one or two things from this series that you think, maybe one way to put it is this, you know, if in a year nothing has changed, you know, what would be the things we think in a year I'd like that to be a bit different? You know, in a year, actually, I'd like to have grown 
and be walking more closely in Jesus' ways. Um, so, but before we do that, I just want to read a verse from Titus, and I'll pray for us. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have given yourself for us. Lord, as we hear these words, that it's not just anyone speaking. Lord, it's you who rules the universe. But it's also you who have gone to the cross on our behalf, the shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep. And it's you, Lord Jesus, who have walked this yourself. Lord, you've shown us what this, what this is like. Lord, it, it's not just idle words. And Lord, we, we know that you have given yourself for us, yes, to purify us and, and, and redeem us from wickedness. Lord, but also uh, to lead us into your ways, eager to do what is good. So just now as we reflect, Lord, put things on our mind and our hearts, but also give us courage and the help of your spirit to live this out in the week ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a few minutes and then Anne will come back up to lead us.